Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. This is my first live conference since everything started. So happy to see you guys. <laughs> um, I really miss talking to real people in, instead of doing conferences in a, in a screen. So anyways, this, this talk is um, it's about actors and ACA, you, you know, using actors. And I wanted to do, I've done this talk with the, you know, I've got a bunch of demos that I'm going to be showing you, demo projects that you guys can grab. But I wanted to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the code. And what I've been trying to do with these demos is have kind of a fun user interface where you can actually watch things happen while things are running. So I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth between the code running behind the scenes and then some visualization of what's really happening uh, as, as things run. So I, I played with this term. I like eye candy. You know, I, I'm a, I watch movies more for the, the, the user interfaces than the, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, Oblivion was one and uh, um, uh, a couple other ones that, uh, you know, just had some great UIs. And it's like, why don't we have UIs like that? So anyways, um, I like doing that. So anyways, I, I just want to start out with what's an actor, just to kind of get things going. And I always point people to this definition in um, Wikipedia. If you just do a search on Wikipedia actor model, it's going to come into this page. And I just love, whoever wrote this first paragraph, I think did an outstanding job succinctly and precisely defining what an actor is, kind of regardless of how it's actually implemented. So ACA, of course, is an implementation of the actor model, but I just love this definition. So I'm just kind of, I always kind of walk through it sentence by sentence. And the actor model is a, a uh, computer science, in computer science is a mathematical op, um, model of concurrent computation. So actors are inherently uh, concurrent. They have a, a it, it's almost like an elegant form of uh, threading in the actor model. And it treats uh, actors as a uni universal primitive of, of concurrent computation. And, and we'll get into that as, as I go through this and, and into the rest of the talk. So actors receive messages. So you implement actors just like any other class. You know, in ACA, you write actors in Java or Scala. And you implement a class of some kind. And there's methods on it and everything. But the really unique characteristic of an actor is that the only way to communicate outside of an actor to an actor is to send in an asynchronous message. And that, that um, is one of the things that uh, you have to get used to when you, you start using actors. But when I, I, I remember I, I stumbled across Akka when I was actually desperately searching for something like Akka. So I was primed for it, and I, I was actually taking an online class. And part of the class had Akka in it, and then I started I saw Akka and I started looking as I, oh, this looks kind of interesting. And then I started getting into the actors. And once I kind of built up enough, in, enough intuition on the behavior of an actor, my head exploded. And, and that's been going on for about eight years now. I just, I just, the concept of actors, I think, is just uh, fantastic. So actors receive messages and these asynchronous messages. So when an actor receives a message, it can make local decisions. And, you know, of course, code gets in, uh, uh, executed. A message comes in that triggers some code processing, your business logic processes, things like that. But where it re really gets interesting is that in response to a message, one, thing, one of the things that an actor can do, it doesn't have to do it, but it can create other actors. And it can send messages to other actors. And this is where the concurrency comes in, where, say, an actor gets a message to perform some kind of a task, but that task can be broken down into subtasks. So what the actor could do is delegate the work of these subtasks out to child actors or other actors. And they can send, you know, they, they could send like, you do one, you do two, you do three, you do four, right? And I've just, me, I just fire off those messages. Now, you guys are running in parallel. You know, and this is threading without hurting yourself, basically. Um, Another big thing, and I think this is kind of subtle, but it's really important, 
And I think the uh, ACA team has tried to do a good job of, of making this more pronounced and, uh, and um, aware at, at the development level, is that actors, in response to a message, they determine how they're going to respond to future messages. So I think an, an example of this would be that, say you have an actor that represents a shopping cart. And it's the, you know, it's the state of a shopping cart. So is it, there's an actor for my shopping cart, there's an actor for your shopping cart. So everybody here, say, has, you know, you're loading up a shopping cart, you each have an actor for your, your, an instance for your shopping cart. It has the state of your shopping cart in it. It's received mess receiving messages like add an item to the cart, add another item to the cart, remove an item from the cart. And say, um, then it gets a, me you know, a message in, say, okay, submit the order. Now that's a major state change of the shopping cart in that its behavior changes from that point on. So if it gets another message, say, add an item to a shopping cart after the order has been submitted, the actor's behavior is different. It's going to react differently to that message. And that's formally you know, a part of the definition of an actor and is formally part of the implementation of an actor. And then actors are the only thing that can modify their private state. So, you know, like I said, that you implement actors in a class, but, um, you know, the, uh, the class is, you know, written like any other class, but none of the methods in the, in the actor are referenced outside of the actor itself. The only methods that are uh, accessed really are the methods that handle the incoming messages, and those are indirect because they're coming, it's not like one object calling another you know, object instance calling a method on another object instance. It's one object instance kind of sending through, through an actor system, here's an asynchronous message that gets received by this other object, but um, that's it. So the, the state changes that occur only occur in uh, reaction to a message. And the only way to affect the uh, state of another actor is through messaging. So if I want to change this, you know, say one actor wants to change the state of another actor, that actor has to send in a message. That's the game. So this is it. This is kind of the, this is why I like this definition. It really sums it up. If you really wrap your head around what's being said in this paragraph, you kind of get actors. And that's kind of one of the humps that people have to get over when they, they get into using Aka is kind of get, I, I kind of think, think of it as actor think, you know, actor intuition. So really, I, I, that's it. I just really want to kind of dive into the code. So to find the code, you know, I thought I would just give you a search term versus a bunch of links. So if you just search for GitHub, McKeeh3, which is my user in GitHub, and Aka-type, what should pop up are links to uh, a bunch of uh, projects that I've got out in GitHub. And I've already grabbed one of them. So this is the readme in this Aka-typed Java cluster project. Uh, I tried to add, I, I'm constantly adding stuff to the readmes. But in, in these readmes, there's links. Uh, these first four projects are the ones I'm going to be spending the most time on. And the way this works is that each project builds up on the, on the last one. So th this first project is kind of a bare bones, uh, minimalistic uh, example of running a cluster with very, you know, like one simple actor in it, basically. The next project takes that first project and adds a little bit more to it. The third project takes the second project and adds a little bit more to it. So really, I'm just going to be going through this fourth project, which is a culmination of all three of the prior project. It's got, you know, it's got all the logic in it. So it's this cluster sharding project. And I've, I've already got this project cloned. So the first thing I'm going to show you is that there's a bunch of scripts that come in this project. The main script, that I, and this is just stuff I wrote. It's just for this demo. Uh, but it's, you know, this demo is very, uh, it's built to run on your local machine, be as lightweight as possible, things like that. But I wanted to make it easy to run stuff. So th the main script is called Akka. That's where you start. And in this main script, it's got... Um, if you just type Aka, it'll give you the a help. So it's got commands kind of in three groups. There's a, a set of commands for starting and stopping a cluster, getting its status, and then the dashboard and a viewer are the user interface components of it. The second group is for starting and stopping individual nodes in a cluster, and I'll show you what, what this is in just a moment. 
And then the third group is for manipulating the local network so that you can play with what's called split brain. So you can actually cause a split brain, which is uh, the bane of the existence of distributed systems. It's like when the network, when you get a network partition where, say, a switch in the network breaks and a bunch, you know, some nodes are cut off from other nodes in the cluster. With these commands, you could simulate this and play with a split brain um, on your system. The README uh, in this first project has documentation on setting it all up. I wish I had time to, to do it in, in this session, but I, I don't really think I do. So what I do is I'm just going to start the cluster. So if you just do an ACA cluster start, it's going to kick off, by default, nine nodes. You can, it, it, the maximum is nine nodes. You can start one node, three nodes, five nodes, whatever you want to start up. And then what, is, what that did was it started up nine JVMs, each one running on a different network address. Oops, I didn't want to do that again. I want to do status. OK, so now I want to bring up the dashboard. So ACA cluster dashboard. So here's the dashboard. So this is also included in the projects. And in the dashboard, what I'm trying to do, it's just some JavaScript I wrote. I'm not a front-end guy, but I, I like playing with it a little bit. So I hobbled this together um, th using a library, a JavaScript library called p5.js, which is really cool. In any case, um, what I'm trying to show here is the cluster running. So when I ran the command, I started up nine JVMs, each one running on a different network address, uh, very specific, local host, and then port numbers 2551 through 2559. And this UI, what it's doing is it's pinging each of the nine nodes, and it's asking it, what does a cluster look like from your perspective? Because that's the thing that's interesting about a distributed system, and having a distributed system that, that tries to work as a one system is how do you do that? Well, the way it works is that when ACA starts up, uh, the nodes in the cluster start talking to each other. They call it gossiping. And they're, you know, they're heart beating each other and things like that. So they're aware of each other. So this is what I'm trying to show. But I'm trying to show from the perspective, say, of, you know, on the, the left hand or the right hand side here where there's just nine panels, each panel shows what the cluster looks like from that node. And then the, the panel on the left is showing what the cluster looks like from uh, what's called the leader node. And the leader is signified by this L, and the O represents oldest. So we'll get into what those do and what they mean as we go through this. So some of the things you can do is, you know, playing around, is I could stop one of the nodes. We'll go back to the... The dashboard. Now, now, if you watch, the nine nodes, they change kind of at their own pace. So you can see that they're kind of, each node is seeing that node, the other nodes is seeing that node one stopped, right? So that, that's what I'm trying to show here. And, and the, um, the up or down or, or leaving, those are life cycle states uh, that each node goes through. That's, this is documented in the ACA documentation. Another thing you can do, though, is... Instead of just doing a clean stop, I can, do a, I can kill a node, which just you know, kills it, kill minus 9. And <clears throat> what you see here is um, the node 7 is down. Now, what happened was it just got cut off. It didn't do a clean shutdown. It just disappeared. The other nodes were pinging it, talking to it, and then all of a sudden they realized, hey, node 7 stopped responding. So now what the um, node, uh, node 7 is declared as being unreachable. And also notice that the leader and the oldest have moved. So the leader moves to the, the uh, node with the lowest IP. That's the simple strategy for what node is the leader. And I'll explain what the leader is in a little bit. The oldest moves to the oldest node. So it happens to be node 3 is the oldest node. And that has some significance that we'll get into later as well. So then you can do things like, I, I want to start one of these nodes. I'll start up node 1. And you can see node 1 come up. 
it kind of appears in each of the other nodes in the cluster, and but it's stuck in a weekly upstate. And what that means is that the leader is, I also highlight in red here, meaning that because there's an unreachable, at least one unreachable node in the cluster, the leader is the node that makes the decision for state changes of nodes in the cluster. That's all it does. It's, it's not a master, it's just a leader. Uh, ma master or master uh, distributed systems with masters are different, where a node is special and it's a master, um, and it has kind of a significant role. Here we tried to make Akka be masterless, but it does have a leader, in it, but the leader's role is minimized to just who's going to decide when a node can join. So in any case, because there's an unreachable node, the, any new nodes joining the cluster can't fully uh, join the cluster. So what I can do is down node 7, which is telling the rest of the cluster, all right, node 7 is gone, let's get rid of it. And now, as soon as that happened, you see that node 1 went from a, uh, a weekly upstate to an upstate. And then if I wanted to, I could restart uh, node 7. But the, the point is that you can play around with the cluster using these scripts. You can see what's happening kind of visually. And that, this isn't the only visual piece. There's, there's some other ones. And kind of, you know, I'm trying to give you some information. And, and it's been fun to experiment with. Like, what, what would the cluster do if I did this or this happened to it type of thing? But let's get into some code. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So, I have a main class where the main method's at. And um, the, main, the, the big thing that's happening here, the main things that's happening in the main, is that the, uh, you, we start up an actor system. So this kind of bootstraps Akka in that JVM. So as every nine, all nine of those JVMs started up, this main method ran, it invoked this uh, actor system create, and it brought up Akka in that node. Akka woke up, and then it, it gets the configuration information, and it knows how to start looking around the network for other nodes in the cluster. And it forms, you know, this is what Akka is doing all this behind the scenes, but it's triggering forming itself into a cluster, you know, jo all the nodes, jo nodes joining each other. But from a programming standpoint, there's three parameters to this, this uh, create method. One of them is this behavior. It, it's called a guardian behavior. And um, this is just an actor. And then the second parameter is just a cluster name. It's just a string. And the third actor is uh, configuration information. The main, the main thing I want to look at is this create method, though. So this is a simple actor. It's called a functional type of an actor. This, and it's re you can see it's returning a behavior. This, this particular actor isn't really set up to receive any messages. It, it's just kind of bootstrapping. And that's why I have a method called bootstrap. This is just my method. You know, it's not a convention. Um, but in this bootstrap method, what I'm doing is starting up other actors. So I'm kind of getting things rolling. So the first actor I start up is I use this context spawn. And this is the way you create an instance of an actor. So it's kind of like the, uh, a new, in, you know, doing a new, but doing a new with Akka is context spawn. So this creates an actor is called cluster listener. If we, if we go to this um, actor, this cluster listener actor into the create method. It just does the same thing. Uh, it, it's doing a, you know, setting up a, uh, a new instance of the actor. And um, in the constructor, though, I wanted to show you what this actor is doing because this is where it gets a little bit more advanced. There's this method called subscribe to cluster events, and that method's right here. And what's happening in this method is that. It, up above, it got this cluster, this reference to a, the cluster. So basically what this is doing is this, this cluster get, you know, using the actor system, gives me an API into the cluster. You know, so I, from my code, I can interact with the cluster. So this is why it's a little bit more advanced. But what I'm doing here is I say, hey, cluster, uh, give me the subscriptions actor. So this is an example of an Akka actor. So there's a lot of Akka actors out of the box. And this is the, the, the first one I'm showing you. And all I'm doing is sending that actor a message saying, uh, subscribe. I want to subscribe. And what I want to subscribe to is cluster events. So what's happening is that when cluster events occur, I want this actor to receive messages from Akka. 
because I want to log them out. Now, all I'm doing is logging, but it, in, a, in the case of if you're writing something that's more advanced um, clustering and you have, want to write some code that knows about changes to the state of the cluster so that you can make decisions with using that, this is the way to do it. So this next method here that I have to implement called create receive, you can see that I'm defining how, uh, how I handle incoming messages, how this actor handles incoming messages. So the only messages that are, that are going to be sent to this actor are the cluster state change events. Like a node join the cluster, a message will be sent to this actor. A node leaves the cluster, a message will be sent to this actor. Now in this actor, all I'm doing is logging them out. But the mechanics of it is here. This is what I really wanted to show, uh, show you. So moving on to the more interesting ones. Um, this HTTP server actor is here. This is what I use to feed stuff from the actor system, from my actors, to the UI. Not going to have enough time to get into that. It, it, I'm going to be here all week. So if anybody wants to sit down and look at this some more with me, I'd be delighted to do it. So let me know. So I'm, gonna, I'm spawning another actor. This one's more interesting, this cluster aware actor. So what's going on there is that this part of the screen here, where you're seeing these little fancy little you know, uh, progress bars, I'm just trying to show activity. You know, I'm, I'm so tired of static screens that don't move. You know, in the movies, they're beeping and bopping, and you know, things are all happening. And we write stuff, and it just sits there, you know, and then you hit a button, and another screen comes up, and it just sits there. You know, I'm just so tired of that. I like screens that actually move like the movies. So anyways, um, these are what I've got is that there's a cluster-aware actor running on each node in the cluster. What this actor is doing is it knows that there are other instances of itself running on other nodes in the cluster. So it wants to send messages to those other instances. So in this demo, all I'm doing is sending in a ping message to these other actors, and then I'm expecting a pong message back. So it's just kind of a ping pong. But the big thing that what I'm trying to show is, is setting up how do actors know about other actors in the cluster running on other JVMs you know, say in Kubernetes or, or in, you know, in a distributed system environment, things like that. So these progress bars are showing the messages that are coming in from and being sent to these other clusterware actors on these other nodes. So this is what I'm looking at is 2551, and it's going to 25, you know, sending messages to 2552 through 2559. If I go over to the next one, it's 2551, it's 2552, so it skips that, and it's sending messages to, to all the other ones. So how do you make that work? That's, that's the fun part. So if we look in the code, we'll go into the cluster where actor. Uh, there's a create method. There's something new here in the setup. Um, there's two lambdas here. There's one lambda that passes in the context, and then there's another lambda that's with timers that passes in a timer. And I'll show you how the timer is used here, right here. So the timer, what the timer can, you can use is to schedule sending messages on some interval or uh, maybe once in the future. So what I'm doing is I want to uh, send a tick message, a kind of a, a trigger message to this actor every interval so that it can, you know, I'm, I'm going to use that so that it can send messages to other actors in the cluster. I don't want to just have it in a tight loop, so I want to have a, you know, a delay in between. So it's about every, on average, about every 50 milliseconds each of these actors is sending messages to all of his counterparts across the cluster. So that's, that's what the, the tick does. But the more interesting one is this, um, this reception subscriber. So the idea is that there's a what's called a receptionist. And it's kind of another relatively new but uh, advanced feature of ACA. And But the, the conception of the receptionist is quite straightforward. If we look at the, each node, each node in the cluster, has, you can think of it as having a receptionist actor on it. And these receptionist actors talk to each other. So what happens in the code is that here I'm getting an actor reference to the receptionist. And I haven't said what an actor reference is before. Um, I apologize. An actor reference is kind of like an actor URL. 
This is the thing you use to send a message to an actor. So this, this, kind, this uh, receptionist method, you can see, returns an actor reference. And then tell is the method for sending a message to that actor through that actor reference, which is location transparent. That actor could be an actor instance running in the same JVM that the actor that's sending the message is in, but that actor could be in another JVM across the network somewhere else. The code's the same. The process is the same. So in fact, we know um, that we're, the, this actor will be sending messages to other actors across the network. But in this case, it, it, it's doing two things. It's registering with the receptionist and it's passing to the receptionist it's this actor's actor reference. So basically it's saying, hey, receptionist, here's my actor reference. I want to make it available to anybody else in the cluster. And then the other thing you can do is subscribe. So subscribe tells the receptionist, anytime your list of actors changes, send me a message with that list. So back in the kind of the picture here, each receptionist is getting registrations and subscriptions. When it gets a registration or subscription, it shares it with all the other receptions, reception, receptionists across the cluster. And it uses distributed data, which is another feature of Akka that I won't be covering, but it's an interesting feature. Um, I haven't used it that much myself, uh, but it's, it's there. In any case, the, the receptionists share this data. They share the list. There's a common global list across the cluster. As that list changes, it's shared with all the subscribers. So what this actor does then is it sets up its behavior, and this is the, uh, on, you know, you say on message, and, and there's different flavors of on message, but you can see this is based on class type. So whenever I get that list of listeners, you know, the, 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 uh, the, thing, the things that registered, um, this onListener method gets invoked, and it, and it passes me, you know, this actor the list. But the, the more fun part is the tick method. On the tick method, I just have this other method called ping up colleagues. And in ping up colleagues, it's really just down here. I'm just uh, setting up a stream going through the instances of the actors on, in this list. And I'm filtering out uh, instances on nodes that aren't up and think, you know, just a few things like that. But then ultimately, on this line, I'm taking, the, I get the actor reference to the remote actor, and I do a tell, and I send them a, a, a ping message. So that's what's causing these cluster where actors to uh, send messages around to each other. Okay? And if I do something like uh, stop a couple of nodes, that list will get updated. Let me stop node one and uh, nodes one and six. <clears throat> so those nodes start to go down. You can see they're they're uh, they're leaving, they're exiting. Okay, they're gone. Everything propagates through the the cluster, and then you can see the lists have shortened, right? So that was the subscription, and the reception is feeding this the changes in the list to each of these cluster where actors. And if I start them back up. The, you know, the nodes come back up pretty quickly, they join the cluster, and the list get, get changed. Okay, so visually you're seeing what's happening behind the scenes in, in the code there. All right, moving on. There's a concept of a singleton, and a singleton is an actor where there's only one instance of that actor running in the cluster. And it's running on, this is where the oldest node comes into play. The, by, de, uh, by definition, what Akka does is it the, the single, it, we really don't care as developers where the singleton's running. What we care about is that there's only one instance of that, of that singleton actor running within the cluster. And why, why is that needed? Well, if you need something that has to make a clustered-wide decision without locking and, and things like that, then this is where the singleton comes into play. Now, remember in the uh, Wikipedia definition, um, 
and I'll show you right towards the end here, uh, can only affect uh, the state through messaging. And it, it says right at the end here, removing the need for lock-based synchronization. So you can think of the, the singleton, and any actor really is a uh, critical section you know, in synchronous programming, that there's, there's only one actor that can change the state so that it's, a, by definition, it's always a critical se uh, section because only one thread at a time or one message at a time can be processed by an actor. So this is what's happening with the, the cluster singleton. The cluster singleton is similar to the aware, uh, cluster aware. Uh, but let me go into the cluster singleton real quick. Do create. Um, the big thing here is that right down in the code, I just want to jump forward. The, the way you send a message to the singleton is that you set up a proxy. So on every node in the cluster, you have a proxy. And so you first send the message to the proxy, and then that, me that proxy, which is part of ACA, will figure out how to route the message to the singleton, no matter where the singleton is in the cluster. So the programming is really simple. I'm basically just setting up this proxy and um, with this, this init, and then whenever the, uh, I, you know, I do this on tick, again, using that, that scheduler, I just do cluster singleton proxy, do a tell, which is sending a message, and I send it a ping message. So that what this class is doing is creating an actor that just you know, periodically sends ping messages to the singleton, no matter where it is in the cluster. And that's being visualized over here on the left. These are, these are the singleton statistics. So if I, right now the singleton's on node three, if I stop node three, oops, and go back, what you'll see is now the oldest is on uh, four. And you, I don't know if you noticed I should have pointed out, but the counters it all got reset because I, I'm not saving the state in the singleton. The state is keep, you know the, the the state is just in memory in the singleton. So the, and I'm keeping a, a just kind of running counters like how many messages I received from each node in the cluster. Well, they were in the thousands before I killed that node three and the singleton jumped to node four. Um, but uh, the state got reset. So, it just, but it's just kind of an indication that a new singleton uh, is now running. The routing, though, that my code that I wrote to send messages to that singleton didn't change. I don't have to deal with any of the, of the routing. So, the last part I want to get into is um, another UI. It's called the viewer, viewer cluster, uh, ACA cluster viewer. So it's the same cluster running, but it's a different view. And this one, some, uh, somebody in my, uh, at Lipen said, oh, it looks like a crop circle. Not everybody knows what a crop circle is. Do you guys know what a crop circle is? A crop circle is supposedly people from other planets visit the Earth go into some wheat field and make some kind of weird pattern and then leave without talking to us. And that's proof that there's um, extraterrestrial life. Okay. So anyways, same cluster, but now it's a different set of actors that are running visualized in a different way. So what's going on here? I'm going to start on the outside. These blue circles are instances of a specific actor. And the term used is entity actor. An entity actor is a thing, like a shopping cart or an IoT device or something specific. Each entity actor has some kind of unique ID, like a primary key. So you can see that the keys that I'm using here. These entity actors are running in a, node, a cluster of nine nodes. So the nodes are represented by these big circles. So, so each, one, each one of these different nodes. Now the... Um, I highlight where the oldest is on node four in this kind of purplish color. And I highlight node one because that's where the browser is coming in. And I don't want to kill that node because this crop circle is being fed from that node. If I kill that node, then 
the, you know, the visualization goes away. So when I'm doing demos, I don't want to kill that node. Um, and then these green circles are part of ACA as well. They're called shard actors. So the, the number of shard actors is fixed by configuration. Usually it's like hundreds or, or thousands of these, but in this demo, I'm only running, you, you can see um, that, oops, too far. The entity counts changes, but it's around 130, 140, 150. It varies. So what's happening is that this guy is running, and um, what I can do is I can, you can in a demo, you can kind of click one of these shards to kind of put a laser pointer on it, and then they all get highlighted in red. And then what you can do is, let me pick a different node. Let me pick, where's node eight? I'll pick this one. Node 8. So if I click Node 8 up in the top left, that will stop Node 8. So it goes down. But notice that the shard immediately jumped to another node. And this is cluster sharding rebalancing the load. So Node 8 was a JVM that was up. It was running Akka. It was handling a whole bunch of entity actors. Here's like a 10 or 20. I'll show you a demo in a minute that um, has 250,000 nodes or entities running, uh, very similar. And um, these, these entities are getting messages. And you know, we, lo we lost a node in a cluster. Well, what happens is that the entities just get recreated somewhere else in the cluster. So Akka noticed that a node stopped or is un, uh, unreachable, and it rebalanced the workload. So you can see now that th this one, this shard that I was highlighting here with red, you know, this it's shard ID two, just an ID. But the entity actors that they always hash to this shard, they were on that node eight. Now they're on node um, two. Okay, and if I restart. Um, what were the two nodes that were down? Three and eight. So when I restart, what we'll see is a little bit of rebalancing. We'll see nodes three and eight appear here in just a moment. And then we'll see some of the shards get distributed to it. So what happens is Akka saw it lost some capacity and rebalanced on the re reduced capacity. And then here they go. You could, the two shards just, or two nodes just appeared, and four shards were rebalanced there. So this is all being handled outside of our code. Okay? But, and often people use this, like uh, if you're familiar with Logom. Logom is a nice framework, that's, but it's kind of uh, very component based and it's very somewhat uh, kind of programming of guardrails, some very prescriptive. It uses Zaka cluster, clustering. Um, below the abstraction layer. Most developers aren't even, don't even care. They don't need, they, and you don't need to know. Um, but this is more advanced and getting, getting into more uh, fun stuff. So if we go to the main, the cluster sharding is set up in this method. And this should be starting to become a bit of a uh, recurring theme. We say cluster sharding, hey, I want to get cluster sharding using, um, using the actor system. And then with cluster sharding, there's an init method that has um, just this one parameter that you can build using this convenience uh, static method called entity of. And entities are, they have a, <clears throat> you can have multiple cluster sharding groups running in the same cluster. So each group has this kind of its own key. But the main thing is this is lambda here. So what happens is that when I'm in the lambda, what I'm passing is a, a function that, it, that cluster sharding uses to create an instance of an entity actor when it's needed. So you can see, uh, it, you know, this isn't executed now, it's executed as needed. So as, as each uh, entity starts up, 
the, that lambda is invoked. And what I haven't sh talked about yet is you might notice that things are kind of moving around. They're kind of poofing out of existence. That's called passivation. So if, an, if this is configurable, when, but an entity actor will stay in memory, it'll be brought into memory, you know, an instance will be created the, time, the first time it receives a message. But if it stops receiving messages after a configurable period of time, it will passivate itself, meaning it will shut itself down and get out of memory. So I've kind of tuned this demo app just to the point where things are percolating through, where you can, um, you know, actors are leaving and joining just to kind of show passivation happening. But that's what's going on here. So, moving on. Um, in the abstract for the talk, I said there were four projects. I want to show you a couple of bonus projects real quick. Um, I still got a bit of time here. Um, so this is the cluster, sh another version of the, this cluster sharding crop circle demo, but running in Kubernetes. So it's a couple of different projects, and uh, there's actually two uh, clusters running here. And I'm simulating, you know, they're deployed as, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, they're deployed as pods. You know, they're in a uh, Docker image, you know, so it runs a container, runs, and the container runs a JVM. One JVM is just generating HTTP traffic, which is kind of shown here in the top right. So these are HTTP messages coming into the second ACA cluster running in its own pod, or set of pods, uh, three here, and uh, but basically doing the same thing. So I, I, demo, I, I use this as an example of deploying ACA to Kubernetes and um, to demo you know, Kubernetes running in, in a cluster. So those projects are, it's that the simulator and visualizer linked here. The final one I want to show you is this one. So this one I call Where on Earth. This was, it took me a while to build this. Um, it also, it was, it was like my first big interesting deployment to Kubernetes. But also, this UI was fun as well. So what this is showing is it's kind of a simulation of an IoT application. So there's two microservices here. One is an IoT microservice that's receiving you know, simulated telemetry messages coming into the microservice. And then there's another microservice that's simulating those IoT devices. So I can run tests without having to have anything external. So you can see that um, devices worldwide is there's just over 251,000 devices that I've created using this little demo app. It's actually running in Kubernetes on three pods, three JVMs and both, both microservices. So it's handling a, a quarter of a million. So that crop circle would have 250,000 of those blue circles. There's no way I could draw that you know, in, in a browser. But there's 250,000 entity actors that are alive in this system right now. So what you can do with this is um, you can zoom into the map. It's very much like Google Maps. The UI JavaScript for this is included in the project. And I'm going to zoom into where we're at. I created one device right where we're at, I think. So as I zoom in, you, you can see it just gets bigger. So um, zooming and, and everything is kind of like Google Maps. This little crosshatch is you know, theoretically where the IoT device is located. It's kind of outside the door and down the way a little bit. But the fun part of this is that you can use this demo app to create one device, but you can use it to create lots of devices. So I've just got a few minutes left. So what I'm going to do is I, if I zoom out, when I zoom out, there's this thing at the top left. It's called device density. And you can see the device density says 1,024. So it goes up by a factor of four. If I zoom out or zoom out again, it goes to 4096. So what this means, I'll zoom back to 1,024. What this means is that if I, I can use this user interface to create or, or manipulate a lot of devices. So if I, fingers crossed, because I'm running a demo, 
I just sent in a request to create 1,024 IoT devices. And if, there we go, it's starting to, they're starting to come to life. So what's happening is that the simulator sent over 1,024 gRPC requests to the IoT device service. So it's simulating this big push in traffic into creating 1,000 devices. So the, the, the receiving microservice, using entities, which I just showed you, things like that, got 1,024 requests to create new, you know, new entity instances using cluster sharding, but it's also persisting these things to a database, and the database in this case is Postgres. And it's also using things like projections, which is, this is event sourcing and CQRS, this microservice. So if you're familiar with that, um, I've, and I've done whole talks on, on just this, this demo, but um, the data that we're looking at is in the, the query side. You know, command, CQRS is command query responsibility segregation. So when a command comes in, like create a new device, that creates an event, but then those events are copied over and projected into a queryable table. The data that we're seeing in the map here is a queryable table, so the, the latency you saw was the whole process of then they, sending over 1,024 devices and then projecting that, all, those event, all that event data into the uh, projection. And just a wrap up with what well, I'll do, because it's at the end, I'll, I'll create 4,000. I just sent in a request to create 4,000. So that's running pretty fast. So 4,000 requests came over. 4,000 entities were, were lit up, brought to life. 4,000 messages, events written to databases, events copied over and projected into a queryable table. So to wrap up, so, so just real quick, what happened in the, in the uh, demo is that one click went into the uh, simulator microservice. But through actors, the way I took that one click and blew it up into 4,000 uh, individual requests was through a hierarchy of actors. So there's one actor that, rep that covers the whole world. And then just below that, there's two actors that this first actor delegates to that covers each half of the world by longitude and latitude. 180 by, you know, it's 180 by 360, then 180 by 180. The next level down, it divides it by nine into 60, you know, 60 degree regions. The next level down divides it into 20. And all of, it goes down 19 levels to uh, subdividing by, by four. So a region gets broken in, one region gets broken into four, into four, into four, into four. And that's the way the map works. As you zoom in, it zooms in by a factor of four. So it, in the actors, there's this massive hierarchy of actors that was created and I, I tried to show this visually, but it's hard because there's so much detail. So I kind of, I'm zooming in for a very high level detail. That, these are actors. Each, each junction is, represents an actor that's sent forwarding messages down to sub-actors and ultimately down to, the, you know, like what I just did, the 4,000 actors. Um, and this was running across a network. You know, 4,000 actors were cre created across a cluster of nodes, but... The problem, the performance problem was that it was running too slow. The performance problem was running too fast. I had to slow it down because it would cause this tidal wave of requests to come from one microservice to the other one. So the receiving microservice would get like 4,000 requests all at once. And that would kind of overwhelm. So I, there's a rate limiter that I had to actually had to implement in this demo. So in any case. So there's two forms. I sh really what I covered in this talk is kind of a more advanced features, but there's also kind of a simpler feature ca called the uh, more kind of a, a oriented court towards components. This is the logon way. Just want to sh show you really briefly, you know, you, this is, you know, you just implement code to handle incoming requests over the edge, like HTTP or GPC. We looked at the entities. Uh, I didn't really show you anything about the projection, but it, that we're an Earth demo has projections in it, how, and how you do CQRS with Akka. Handling incoming messages CSA from a message bus that feeds into entities, and then having uh, writing out. But that's, this is basically the components. And just to wrap up, there's actually three parts to Akka now. There's this new part that's in beta right now. It's called Akka Serverless and it's the component part. So it's basically taking Akka and putting it on a serverless platform. So if you're interested, 
just search on Aka Serverless. It, it's an open beta. It's free for use to play with. It's quite interesting. Plus, it's polyglot. So it's not limited to Java and Scala anymore. Um, it officially supports JavaScript, soon to support TypeScript. People are already doing things with Kotlin, with Python, and I think Go, but many other different languages. Resources, just Google Aka documentation. There's also an Aka platform guide that's really, um, it's new, but it's like an iterative development process for setting up kind of a shopping cart system composed of three um, microservices. Kind of fun. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. <laughs> but I, you know, I got time for questions. No questions? All right. Thank you.